how you know what good friends are. We have been together for three months, we picked right up where we left off. So that's awesome. Um, who knows what the, the theme for the weekend is? What, what is it? Stand. Stand. Yes, two people knew it. Awesome. All the social media stuff we put out there. Yes, it is the stand, okay? Um, when I was working through what week, week, we already know themes for this retreat, the winter retreat, and camp next summer. So we work about a year out, okay? Um, I didn't know in May what the theme for the fall retreat would be, okay? Uh, and then it came to me right before camp, and Sam was able to put together a video before camp. We need to talk about standing up and doing what's right. And this summer, I went to seven different churches and visited different places and heard different people speak, and everybody was saying the same thing. They were all preaching from the book of Daniel, and that's what we're going to cover tomorrow in our classes. But the book of Daniel is about standing up for what you believe in, no matter what the consequences are. Amen. Right. The adults say that. <laughs> right? <laughs> because we know that you can do that and make it to 20, 30, 40, 60 years old. Right? All right, so if you knew that you would not fail, and this is, I'm going to give you a chance to talk to you real quick. We've been very serious. Uh, this is a chance to be a little bit serious, but you can, you know, whatever. If you knew that you would not fail, what's something you would try? I know Lorna's mom has been on this, where's Lorna? Has been on this big kick recently of like doing this all crazy. Like she jumped out of a freaking plane. Yes. Um, she wanted to go bungee jumping. She's like on this midlife crisis or something right now. Like, she's doing all kinds. Of, she's like, hey, even if I fail, I'm going to heaven. So, but if you knew, if you knew you could fail, let's go with like five things. What what's something you would try or you would do if you knew you wouldn't fail? I tell her now I would ask a lot more girls out. <laughs> it, it is the hardest thing in the world for a dude to say, hmm, I think I should ask her out. No, this just didn't happen that way. So, what are some things that you would do if you knew you would not fit? And you probably never thought about this before, because you scared. Yeah, what would you do? Like a CIA agent. All right. All right. Jack Bauer. That's a reference from a long time ago. Anybody else? What would you do if you knew you wouldn't fail? Yeah. Turn back time. Okay. That leads into a whole other conversation. <laughs> if I could turn back time. That's what I'm going to do. Go ahead. Join the U.S. Army and fight for the country. There you go. Two more. I'd probably try to backflip the dirt bike finally. Backflip? I mean, that's kind of dangerous. Well, yeah. If you think about it, you know, it will fail. No reason to give up. Woo! Right. Those are some good things. So, hopefully this weekend you figure out that not only are those some good things, but there's some other good things you can stand up for as well. Okay? Um, your faith being the primary reason what we're going to talk about. The most famous verse probably in the world, because it's at every sporting event ever, is what? John 3.16, it's always behind the field goal. I don't know how that guy gets good, that good seats every time. But I don't know if it's the same guy, but that guy is always there. John 3.16. Uh, Tim Tebow put that on his, his eye black one time. And it just, like he scored a touchdown and they showed a close-up. In like the next three minutes, there's something like five million hits on Google looking up John 3.16. John 3.16 is in the same chapter of the same book of the Bible as the one that the Theodos boys have so proudly proclaimed. Oh, nice. We do this all the time. <laughs> that he must be greater and I must be less. Well, guess what? They're connected. I'm going to show you that here in just a second. If you did not bring a Bible with you this weekend, I brought about 30 of them, okay? You can have one of those. You're going to need it for class tomorrow. So if you need one, they're in that box, standpoint to that box right there. 
They're in that box. If you don't want to keep it forever, give it back. We'll use it for camp next summer. We don't, you know, when we were at the old camp, there were just Bibles laying around everywhere. The people just left and forgot and became part of the abyss of these missing Bibles. But uh, we don't have that here because it's not a church camp. We use it for that. But um, there, there are Bibles there. But I'm going to read uh, out of John 3 tonight. Uh, starting in verse 22. So we're going to kind of work backwards. Um, we'll start with John 3.30, which is the verse of the Beatles boys. Verse, the one I'm wearing tonight. And then we'll get to John 3.16. But starting in chapter 3, verse 22, um, there's Jesus and there's John the Baptist. Those guys are cousins. Okay? And John the Baptist started preaching before Jesus did, saying, this dude's coming, so get ready. Okay? So that's what John's preaching. And then, uh, after Jesus gave the famous verse that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, he goes on and it says in verse 22, After this, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. I've been, I was literally born at preaching school. My dad was in preaching school when I was born. I've been, my first word was Bible, okay? Um, two syllable word, fantastic. Bible. Vance Gummy. Uh, but uh, I had never seen until I was preparing for this lesson that it wasn't just John the Baptist, his name was John the Baptist, was baptizing, but guess who else was? Jesus was. A little fact there for you. It says, now John also was baptizing near Salim because there was plenty of water. So why not? Um, and people were constantly coming to him to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. There came to, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan the one you testified about, which is Jesus. Well, he is baptizing, and everyone's going to him. Sounds like a good old-fashioned uh, contest right. about who is better than whom. To this, John replied, A man can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. By the way, we are the bride of Jesus, who is the bridegroom. Some imagery there for those of you who love English. I teach chemistry and physics, so I'm not one of those. Um, the friends who attend the bridegroom waits and listens for him. And is in full joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. You know why? Because most bridegrooms, or most, most like, grooms want to like run away. You know, so it's good when you hear the groom's voice. It's like, he's here. All right, it's good. All right, we're good. Now, it says, that joy is mine and is now complete. And then it says, he, meaning Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. So this guy is trying to pit them against each other and say, you're better. And he thinks he's better, so who's really better? And John just flat out says, I'm not better. Jesus has to be better. Right. He has to be. Now, I can do... But Jesse has developed, I could just do a mic drop right now and walk away. Because that's pretty much it. Like I can just drop the mic and say, good weekend, see you next year. And walk away because that's the whole point of Christianity. So many times, preachers and worship leaders and old ladies and elders in the church and young people and whoever else try to put themselves ahead of what the real purpose is. It's Jesus. That's it. He's the reason we come to camp. He's the reason we come sleeping in 50 degree weather and freeze our little toesies off in the middle of the night. He is the reason that we are here. The whole reason. And then he says, the one who comes from above, because it's not over there. <clears throat> the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth, belongs to the earth, and speaks as one from the earth. 
but the one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard. And guess what? Jesus, the only human on earth that's been to heaven and been in heaven and been here, now talking to them, knows and sees and has heard things that they haven't. It says, the man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God for God, gives the spirit without limit. Let that sink in for a little bit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. So here's the cool part. Jesus has to be better than us. But this doesn't work. Right? He, when Jews gave a sacrifice, it had to be the best calf or the best lamb or whatever, the firstborn, the best ever, the first 10% of the crops went to him. God got the best. So if Jesus is the best, he wasn't the best sacrifice for us. And none of this matters. But guess what? The one who sent him sent something else for us. And that's the Spirit of God. Right. The same Spirit that raised this Jesus who is greater than us from the dead lives in, in us. And it says here that the, God gives the Spirit without limit. So if I have God's Spirit in me that has no limits, why am I scared to tell my dad about Jesus? Why am I scared to tell my teacher that I don't believe the same things that he's teaching me? Why am I scared to stand up in the lunchroom for somebody who's being bullied? Why am I so scared that I won't even tell my friends I even believe in this Jesus? If we have the Spirit of the living God in us that has no Remember that question I asked in the beginning? If you knew you weren't going to fail, what would you do? You're not going to fail. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you will not fail. Does that mean bad things won't happen to you? Absolutely not. We studied somebody last year named Stephen who got stoned because he was professing Jesus. And I'm not talking about, you know, this guy. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, like, he got killed with rocks that hit him in the head. They threw rocks at him until he was dead. I said, like, what's the, the uh, Dr. Seuss? <laughs> they hit him with rocks in the head. They hit him with rocks until he was dead. <laughs> Maybe I do like English. I don't know. Um, so, not failing does not equal all good things. Come on. Okay? I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here because so many times I have heard you people out of your mouths say this phrase. Well, God just wants me to be happy. He wants good things for me. He wants me to be happy. Nowhere in here... Does it ever anything wrong? Okay. Uh, does anything ever say anything about God wants you to do whatever makes you happy? Amen. Including who you date, who you marry, where you live. None of that is in here. The words you use, nothing. Matter of fact, it says, consider it pure joy when you face trials. So you're saying that this being a Christian thing and doing what is right and taking a stand means not only am I not going to be happy, but I'm going to face trials. Yep. Sign me up. Sign me up. <laughs> this is the feel good retreat right here, baby. John 
16 now. I'm insane. Well, that's not John. All right. John 3. And we won't start at 16. We'll start a little bit before that. Jesus, right before this, was talking to a guy named Nicodemus. That he was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were like the Jewish rulers and people who knew about the Bible and about God. And um, this guy came to Jesus and said, I know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Good job, Sherlock. That's uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty intense there. No one can perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. And Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Jesus thought he'd throw a curveball there. Okay? Curveballs are not easily hit. And so he was throwing something that he couldn't just get. Okay. Right again. Dang it. So Nicodemus, being a man of science like I am, says, wait a minute. How can a man, I think my son is here, uh, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter the second time into his mother's womb to be born. Please do not get a mental image of any of that. Yes. Jesus answered, they weren't even listening, so they don't know. Um, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. That's the baptizing he was doing a little bit later on. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised when he said he must be born again. The wind blows whenever it pleases. You hear a sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it's going. So it is with the Spirit. How can this be? Says Nicodemus. He says, you're a teacher of Israel, right? And you don't understand these things, but I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. Now, Jesus goes on and says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him can have eternal life. Dave, do you understand that reference to Moses? Yeah. Anything? Tell us about that. Yeah, there was a... <laughs> A point in the Old Testament where Moses was leading the nation of Israel, and the, the people's disobedience had reached enough of a point where God had said, "Okay, I need to teach them a lesson. They need to learn something." There were a bunch of snakes in the camp, and snakes were biting people while they were getting sick and dying. And so there was a bronze serpent that uh, that Moses had, and he put it on a post and was carrying it through the camp, and wherever. Anybody saw that bronze serpent, their, their sickness stopped. And so it was anybody who was able to look upon that bronze sculpture, not sick. So you're saying they disobeyed God and he sent snakes to kill them. They were doing what made them happy and God was killing them. Don't let it out there again. So, um, so then he says... Just like that, and God was saying them then, the Son of Man must be lifted up. He must become greater, and we must become less, so that everyone who believes in Him can have eternal life. And it says in verse 16, the most famous passage of all time, other than Jesus wept, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. It is not our job, because it was not Jesus' job, to condemn everybody. Not our job. You know, everybody these days said, you can't judge people. That's right. I can't. I guess you can. God can. You should be worried about Him, not me. Right? God can send me to hell. I can't. I can't. God can. But guess what? Whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. He's already won for us. If you could pick one person to be on your three-on-three -three tournament team at camp, basketball tournament, at camp. Would LeBron James be a good person who's a foot taller than anybody here? Well, maybe not a foot, but... Um, <laughs> a good eight inches. Um, who's a foot taller than me and who just won Cleveland a world championship? Would he not be a great guy to have on your team at camp? That's what it's like having Jesus on your team. He's already beat the world. He's already beat Satan. If he's already beat Satan for you, why can't you do something for him? He is greater. Thank you, Lord. Right. 
greater than us. And because of that, we can stand up for what is right. That's not easy. Because choices have consequences. Some of them are eternal. Those are the ones you really need to worry about. Okay? Your choices, who you, who you date, who you do things, pick the things. Uh, Jason, right? We did the things. Uh, <laughs> it was the skit at camp on Sunday night. <laughs> they did the things again. The things you do can have eternal consequences. Guess what? They can also have earthly consequences, right? So earthly consequences include taking your car away, taking your cell phone away. It can also include unwanted pregnancies, unwanted diseases, unwanted lots of things and guilt and shame and all these things. Okay? So, um, it can also include death, like in all these heroin deaths that are going on right now. So, there are consequences to your choices. Good or bad. Your choices, I mean. Because, sometimes when you choose to do and stand up for what God has said is the right thing. And guess what, folks? There is right and there is wrong. Okay? Um, so many people don't want to say that there is definite truth. There is. There is. I know I'm blowing some of your minds tonight. Um, and, and I know I may be upsetting some of you. But this is the truth. There is the truth. Jesus is the truth. When you stand up for the truth, you can lose family members. You can lose best friends forever. Sometimes you can lose your job. We're going to talk on Sunday. Uh, we're going to be together briefly on Sunday. We've got to get out of here a little bit earlier this year because we've got another group coming in. But we're going to talk about some real life, current day examples um, of people who have stood up for the truth, who have lost their jobs, who have lost their careers, who have lost their businesses, who have been thrown in jail because they did what Jesus asked them to do. Those are earthly consequences, but guess what? Those consequences, none of them can ever affect their salvation. Mm -hmm. Ever. You choosing not to stand up for the truth can have negative consequences on your salvation. Which would you rather have? A good friend for about three years or eternity with Jesus? Now, I know when you're 15, it's really hard to say, I, I really do like this dude. You know, he's, he's kind of cute, he treats me well, I need attention, he gives me attention. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, I like the positive attention he's giving me, it's not really positive, but um, you're saying I, I, I have to not be around him to do what's right? Sometimes. Sometimes. You know, a song we just sang uh, said this phrase, you're never going to let, never going to let me down. If you choose to take a stand for Jesus, he's never going to let you down. If you choose to stand up for a friend, how many of you have been hurt by a friend before? Right? Like literally everybody. If you choose to stand up for that friend who can stab you in the back the very moment that you're standing up for them, just because you think their earthly friendship means more than anything in the world? Again, I have 40 years of experience. You have like 15 to 18-ish. It's a lot easier to look back on 40 and say, you know what? God got me through that. And that. Ooh, yeah, and that. <laughs> Dumb. But I lost that friend. And I still have this one, but I wish I didn't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some 
parents are like that. Like, oh, they just drain you, you know? Um, if you had to choose one person to do life with, I mean, I know in here, because I've been doing camp thing for a long time, I've been watching, I watch people, I, I, you know, I watch, uh, we had a, I teach online school now, and uh, we had a, an event today uh, in Cleveland uh, at the zoo, and there was a thousand uh, uh, of our students there. It was awesome, but it was great people watching. I love, love watching uh, people. But I've been watching people for a while, and I know, I know. <laughs> Yes. 
When somebody stands up for you and says, I am with you, I've got your back, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure we get through this. Right? Moses said, stand, and you will see today that God is going to show up and fight for you, and that's the best thing you could ever happen because God is going to win. Right? God is going to win. This weekend we're going to see some cool stories uh, about uh, people standing up for what they believe in. Some of them ended well. Some of them did not. But guess what? The all can get to heaven anyways. And some of them did. Okay? I'm going to have uh, Abby tell a story on Sunday about how she did uh, in, her, in her high school career. And, and for, the, for the year and a half she was left in high school, it wasn't great. Guess what? She now runs a, a school district, and those people are working at Bob Evans. Nothing wrong with working at Bob Evans, but, you know, she's successful, I'm just saying. So, um, we're going to see some stories. Tomorrow we're going to look at the book of Daniel. There are three different stories in the book of Daniel. That's what our classes are going to be about. We're going we're to hear about how these young men who were your age stood up to this king who had just conquered their people and said, you know what? I'm not going to do what you want me to do. Sorry. And their exact words are, I don't care if you kill me. Because one, God will either save me or take me to heaven. And I'm okay with that. Another one was um, a story, of, so that was about food, right? Good story, food. Uh, another one was about this dude, this king, built a tower, a, a, a statue of himself. Not like, not like, 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 like a six foot statue. I'm talking, this statue was made out of gold. It was nine feet wide, which is about this. Ninety feet tall. This is ten, so nine more. <laughs> Ninety, that's a, where'd they get that much gold? And where is it now? Right. <laughs> Daddy can buy us a new camp, I'll just say. Um, so, nine feet high, or nine feet wide, ninety feet high, and, and he says, you know what, every time you hear this, this horn go off, you gotta worship this thing. They said, ah, uh, <laughs> I'll worship my God, who is the God, Amen. you can keep yours. So we'll see how that goes. And this other guy said, guess what? Uh, you can only pray to me now. I'm the new guy. You can only pray to me. And this, uh, and Daniel said, uh, uh, no. <laughs> so we'll see how that went for them tomorrow. And then I'm going to talk to you uh, tomorrow night about a guy. And this may sound familiar. Uh, and it may make you feel feelings about yourself. But his family hated him. His dad loved him. Gave him special gifts. His family hated him because of him. They were jealous. Right? And because of that, guess what they did? They threw him in a pit, took his special coat that his dad gave him, covered him in animal blood, said, ah, the lions, I think they got him. <laughs> so dad thinks he's dead. They, they sold him into slavery and made some money on the side. Right? Your brothers selling you into slavery. So then he goes and lives in this foreign land. And um, things happen. He's got to stand up for what he believes in. And uh, it doesn't go great. But then it gets better. Like, than, than ever, kind of thing. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow night. And like I said, Sunday morning we'll talk about uh, some real life examples. Uh, Dave and I are going to go uh, to the funeral tomorrow morning. We will not be here probably till mid to late afternoon. Uh, my wife, who should be here, she may be setting up the baby's bed. Um, my, my son is all my children, well, except the baby. But my newborn son that we made it through camp is here this weekend. So we're excited about that. So, I have to do this for at least 20 more years to get him through camp. So, um, so 20 more years, Dave. All right. Dave will be 130, so. Uh, so, um, Emmy is going to kind of run the show tomorrow. 
uh, until we get back, uh, so she's agreed to do that. So we're glad you're here. We're glad we're talking about this because it's something that affects everybody's life. Everybody in here has had a chance to stand up for what is right and done the wrong thing. And if you haven't yet, you will. Okay? Um, let me tell you this one quick anecdotal story, and I will be done. So, second grade, and I may have told this story already, but I don't think everybody heard it. Second grade, we have these little magnet uh, things that go on refrigerators, like, like letters and numbers, and uh, like apples and bananas, they like stick on the fridge. And on the back, you turn over, the little magnet part like just slides right out, right? So my, my buddy Mike steered off, right? He says, check this out. Perfect. Ha ha, magnet, right? Which is sweet. I love magnets. What eight-year-old boy doesn't love magnets and all the things you can do? So I start collecting magnets, right? I need to know I, I'm good at math, so I need to know math first so I can go play with the magnets and steal them, right? It's eighth grade. The teacher says, Somebody is stealing our magnets, and if we don't stop and turn them back in, we're done with magnets. I'm like, this is, uh, somebody should probably turn themselves in. <laughs> and, uh, well, Mike Steerhoff did, and ratted me out. Good friend he was. <laughs> so, the teacher comes to me and says, I think you're stealing magnets. And I said, I don't want your problem. <laughs> she goes, I'm going to let you sit here for about five minutes. Great tactic, by the way, parents and tactic. Uh, I'm going to let you see you about five minutes, and then you let me know what's, what's going on. So clearly, Jesse is the most creative person in our house. Like, ridiculous savant, which means he can't ever shut it off. Like, ridiculous. He could have come up with a much better story than the one I'm about to tell you. <laughs> My story was this. So the teacher comes back. I had to stand in recess, by the way, which you can't really tell now, but I was quite the athlete as a child and, and loved kickball, was the master of kickball, also recess football, which got taken away from us because, uh, whatever, because we weren't allowed to be mean or whatever. Um, and so I came up with this. I told the teacher, my dad works at a magnet factory. <laughs> Clearly not a Jesse creation. Uh, and because of that, I can bring you all of the magnets that you need. <laughs> so for a week, I stood on the wall at recess while my friends were throwing balls over my head, hitting them on the wall and torturing me because I was not allowed to play with them. Because she clearly realized my dad, first of all, first of all, if there was such a thing as a magnet factor, <laughs> there wasn't one in Mary's where I lived. So clearly the teacher knew I was lying. <laughs> The teacher gave me an opportunity to do the right thing, and I chose not to. Now, you may not have a hard time believing this, but at eight years old, that was one of the very last times in my life that I've lied. Because I learned my lesson, uh, I did not like standing on the wall at recess. Um, so if you may or may not, by the age of eight, had a chance to do the right thing and not done the right thing, you may be 18 and not had that opportunity yet, but you will at some point in your life, whether it's at work, in your family, in your relationships, you will have an opportunity to stand up for what God says is right. Hopefully, after this weekend, you start choosing to do that. Okay? God... And the reason why I told you at the very beginning that I was getting confirmations all summer long from different churches, from different pastors, and from different people that God's message needs to be heard, that He wants His people to stand up for Him. Okay? That's what we're talking about this weekend. I'm glad you're here. Um, in about...